Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening gathering. Tonight I promise to talk about the middle way. A question was asked about last night about what exactly the middle way means. Which I think is important to talk about, first of all, because it's often misunderstood easily abused, but also because it does in many ways capture the essence of what we're trying to do, if understood properly. It's a little bit um, misleading when we talk about the middle way, right? Because it seems to sound like there's a happy medium in between two things where um, you don't go extreme on anything but on the other hand you don't give up anything and that's not generally speaking if I can speak for the Buddha which of course is uh, fraught with some danger that's not generally how, how the middle way is understood Take, for example, the first teaching of the Buddha. This is the most famous, most well-known usage of this idea of the middle way. So, uh, first of all, some background. We're talking about uh, it's a talk given to five ascetics, five um, Hindu or Indian ascetics who had left Brahmin society because they, like many before them, thought to themselves or realized that there was uh, something quite wrong about the indulgence and sensual pleasures. So religion that was associated with sensuality, where the priests and the uh, supplicants or the applicants, those who practiced the sacrificial rituals, they really weren't getting anything out of it. So there was this movement in the time of the Buddha to leave behind and, and turn away from sensual pleasure with the realization that it was an addiction. It was something that kept you tied to samsara. It was a strong uh, sort of mystical tradition. A lot of talk about rising above and getting beyond samsara. Different ideas of what it meant, of how to see through the illusion of sensuality and how to break free from the bonds of sensuality. And so what you had was a, 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 a strong, a, a, a broad movement to uh, go to the other extreme. Right. Of course it wasn't thought of this way, it was you reject something and so the other thing is the right thing. The opposite, for lack of a better word, is the right thing. And so you had a lot of people in the time of the Buddha torturing themselves, inflicting pain upon themselves, thinking that if pleasure is the wrong way, then of course the right way must be whatever the opposite is, pain. So if you torture yourself, you could free yourself from any desire for sensuality. It's kind of odd when you think about it, but there's an odd sort of logic to it. You beat it out of yourself, right? Somehow we think this when we punish people, right? We punish children 
who are, are following their cravings by hitting them. We think if we give them pain, somehow it'll make them want pleasure less. It's kind of an odd sort of reasoning, but we have this sort of reasoning, right? Sandy, if you hurt someone, they'll for some reason be less inclined towards pleasure, which of course seems to be the opposite. Makes one want to rethink the whole idea of punishment, right? But it's of course aren't into punishment. It's very bad karma. But so this was the wrong view. This was the wrong idea. And when the Buddha came to teach the middle way, he said, Dvemi bhikkhuve anta. There are these two anta, these two ends. An anta is like the end of something, the extreme. I mean, it doesn't usually mean extreme, but it, it's used in that way here. It means the, the, um, the extremity, you know, the, the very end of something. So you have two ends of the spectrum, basically. And so it sounds like he's saying that somewhere in the between there's a happy medium where you don't go overboard with sensuality. Um, but on the other hand, you don't uh, torture yourself too much. And so we find meditators often taking up this view of a, a moderate view. It's okay to engage in some addictions. You know, if you're addicted to chocolate, it's okay to you know, enjoy the chocolate. It's just it's moderation. Just don't have too much. Alcohol. Some people go to the extent, Buddhists go to the extent of moderation in alcohol. Don't have enough to get drunk, just enough to get a little happy, a little liberated, I suppose. And uh, don't push yourself too hard, but you have to push yourself. You have to force yourself to do things, because who wants to really spend weeks and months meditating? Or push yourself to do it. Force yourself a little bit, but not too much. No, we maybe don't use the word force, but we have a sense that you have to push yourself. Just don't push yourself too hard. Moderation. It's not at all really what the Buddha meant. I mean, we can see that from the text. It's sensuality of any of any sort is is um, useless. It's not just useless. It's problematic. It's wrong. Indulgence, not sensuality exactly. So of course, experiencing sensuality is not wrong. Looking at something beautiful is not a problem, but indulging in it in the sense of enjoying it, appreciating it, liking it. Liking it is the point. Well, the, the way the Buddha said, uh, said was, he may eat a anupagama. Means anupagami means not even, not approaching these two, not going to these two extremes. The Buddha found the middle way, you know, right? So we think, well, yes, somewhere in the middle is where you have to find, and maybe it's a very fine line, but it's somewhere in between these two. When in fact, it really isn't. If you look at what the Buddha talked about as being the middle way, it has nothing to do with either of the others. And so it's actually sort of exposed as, as a mere uh, artifice of the Buddha. If you understand in the context, it makes sense. He was trying to say, look, you've gone to the other extreme, and it's just as useless as the other extreme. They're both useless, is what he was saying. Forget about those two. Let's uh, try a third alternative, actually. To one extent, to, an, to some extent, though, um, it feels very much like being in the middle. And as with other, there's another, we'll go through a couple of other ways that it can be, you can understand, or it was used in the, in the Pali Canon and in the commentaries. But it's very much in the middle. It's not just a third alternative, like, oh, he found another extreme to go to. It's, it's, in a sense, it's the extreme of, 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 uh, of 
being free from uh, from something, from from any sort of um, extremism, if that makes any sense. So, if you think about what the Eightfold Noble Path, what the, what the Middle Way is, being the Eightfold Noble Path, if you look at it, it's very much about not this nor that, or, or, or anything really. So, when sensuality comes up, it's not about any sort of moderation. But on the other hand, it's not about rejection, or, or avoidance, or, or self-torture. So in a sense, it is right in that fine line in the middle. It just has nothing to do with the other two. When you experience something beautiful, for example, I mean, there's nothing beautiful about what you're seeing. The beautiful, ugly, is really meaningless. It's, it's all very much in our, our minds, according to our past habits and our genetic makeup and so on. And so the middle way is really a, a, the more simple experiencing things, uh, objective experience. When you see something, to be aware that you're seeing it. When you feel pain, to be aware that you're feeling pain. Yeah, so this idea that somehow you should avoid, this, this other idea of, um, I guess it's the opposite, in fact. So on the other hand, some people will say you, you shouldn't see beautiful things, right? Take down all your, anything that could be beautiful. If there's music, plug your ears. Uh, food, make sure you have only plain food, nothing delicious, nothing that could be considered delicious. Don't ever eat chocolate, that would be, that would be bad, right? And on the other end, don't ever succumb to, don't ever um, expose yourself to pain. So, you have people who would say, you know, sitting through pain is self-torture. It's very much against what the Buddha taught. Mahasi Sayadaw goes on about this guy here. He goes on and on about it. Well, not on and on, but he explains it quite well. He says that, um, you know, that, that these well-meaning meditation teachers will guide their students to always avoid pain. When pain comes up, to change position, always be in a comfortable position so you never experience pain. But he says it's quite misguided. The Buddha, in fact, quite clearly, well, in the text that we have, um, says that you should be willing to bear with pain even if it, even if it kills you, even deathly pain. It can be a great catalyst for enlightenment. So the middle way in this sense, I mean, it's just talking about a way that is free from any kind of reaction, a way that is free from any kind of ambition or drive or exertion. It's in fact effortless. Um, the reason why meditation seems like such a chore is because we're so lazy, because we're so much to the indulgent side, or because we're forcing it, we're practicing self-torture, when we meditate we force our minds, no, stay with the stomach, no, stay with the foot, no, don't go wandering, don't get greedy, don't get angry. We fall to the extremes, we fall to the extremes because we're not present, we're not in the center, in the middle, right? So it's not exactly a spectrum. It's not. It's not that. You know, take everything to moderation. It's freedom from them both, which puts you right in the center, puts you centered, pure. I mean, if you think purity, what is purity? It's the the f freedom from defilement. Um, clarity is the freedom from being clouded, being obscured, being blurred. What is right? Uh, if you look at the Eightfold Noble Path, it's, it's all about right, samma, ditti, right view. And, and right view is really, for the most part, just not having, not having any wrong view. It's about having views of reality, what is, what is the nature of reality. 
there's nothing, you know, it's not like the middle, the, 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 the right view is just knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, which there's nothing, it's not like that's moderate. It's in between two things. It's just freedom from any other kind of view. And so on. So if you look at the Eightfold Noble Path, you can clearly see it's not at all about moderation. It's about being right and, and, and pure in the sense of not having anything that diverts you, takes you to an extreme. And the other way that the middle way is used is uh, well, it's used in different ways. Another way it's abused is to give the idea that the Buddha didn't teach non-self, or that non-self doesn't mean there is no self. It in fact doesn't mean there is no self, but it's important to nuance this and be careful. So people say, well, because it doesn't mean there is no self, no, the Buddha never, as far as I know, said that. He certainly didn't deny it. But as I've said many times, this is because of the nature of reality. There is no self is just a, a statement that doesn't make any sense. It's like saying there is no cat. You know, well, cats are not things that exist, I mean, neither are selves. So you say, well, cats don't exist. Well, what do you mean? I have a cat. Right? So it's confusing. Cat is, is, is an abstraction, it's on a whole other level of reality. Non-self is dealing with reality. So the way the Buddha explained it, you know, people saying that when you die, um, the, the soul continues on. When the body dies, the soul enters another body, the soul is eternal. And other people would say, no, when you die, there is a cessation, there's nothing, there's no experience, nothing. And the Buddha said, these are two extreme views. These two views are, are wrong view. So he said he, you know, he teaches dependent origination, which is in the middle. Why is it in the middle? Well, because it, it describes a causal chain of experience, and yet it doesn't rely upon the conceptual uh, abstraction of there being a self or something, something that would be totally uh, outside of the realm of, of experiential reality that we could call a self. Right? So people get all worried or confused about this idea of, of non-self or did the Buddha actually say there was a self and you know, he really said, let go of all that stuff. You know, Buddhism is really an innocuous, he just, he, he just didn't say anything really. What he pointed out was that we have all these attachments to self. We have ego, we cling to things as being me, as mine, and so on. And so he advocated a giving up of, of self-view, giving up of any view relating to self. I hope I don't sound like I'm trying to say that there is any sort of self. It's not. It was very much on the side of being non-self that any way we could conceive of a self, any conceiving that might go on, that might arise in the mind, I mean, it's just an arisen phenomenon, this belief or this, this thought, hey, maybe there's a self, or I feel like there's a self. All of that is problematic. It's a cause for stress and suffering because then there's clinging. And so he taught what he saw, what we can all clearly see, that there is causal relationships between phenomena between experiences. So very much a middle way. It's a sort of a, um, a view that it should not be considered extreme, but it is. This idea that given that any view of self could be problematic, it sounds very much like there is no self, and then you think, well, what about myself? I was just reading the Wikipedia page on, on the middle way, and it's it claims that in Theravada Buddhism, there's the idea that an arahant, upon passing, neither exists nor non-exists. It says the Pali Canon says that. It doesn't give a citation, so I'd like to have someone go in there and put a citation missing or something, notation, because I'm pretty sure that's not what it says. As I remember in the Pali Canon, it says, someone asks, does an arahant exist when 
after they pass away? Uh, no, that's not the case. Is it that they don't exist when they pass away? No, that's not the case. That, I mean, that, that's not proper to say. Well, do they both exist or, and not exist? No, that's not proper to say. Do they neither exist nor not exist, what it says on Wikipedia? And the answer was no, that's not the case either. Because, because arahant is just a concept. Existence is not like that. Existence is experience. All that exists is moments of experience. So sometimes uh, these, these um, you read these things that the Buddha said, and sometimes it was just an avoidance because people get so confused because they're living in this into this intellectual or conceptual reality where I exist and there are people and places and things. We're very much extreme in this way. We've gone to an extreme of delusion where we believe that things exist, where we're um, caught up in our conceptions, our, our, our sanya, where we recognize things, and it, it morphs into this belief or this, this conception of things as, as existing, as having entities. The real middle way is, is based on the three characteristics and it's very much about not, 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 not. Not permanent, not stable, not lasting. Not pleasant, not satisfying, not happiness. Not me, not mine, not self. What it means is we have all these attachments to things as being me and mine, as being pleasant, as being a source of happiness. and as being stable, as being a refuge. We just learned today in the Visuddhimagga, we got to this, one of the best passages, I think, or, or one of the most important passages, I think, in the Visuddhimagga, not, not for the aspect of the Buddha's teaching that it describes, but just how well it describes the, four, the three characteristics. I mean, these are so important. So it gives 40 ways that come from, I think, the Patisambhida Magga, or maybe even earlier. Forty ways by what you can, which you can understand the three characteristics. We read through that. I encourage everyone. You can look it up. It's in the beginning or the halfway through, maybe the chapter on Magga Magga Jnana Dasana Visuddhi, the purification by knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path. When one first begins to grasp what is the path, that the path is this. The path is seeing through our delusions and our, our ignorance, seeing through our our conception of permanence, stability, and satisfaction, and and control. To see impermanent suffering and non-self, as you start to grasp this, you you make that shift, and you start upon the noble path. That's really the middle way when a person begins to see impermanent suffering and non-self. Meaning they begin to give up or they begin to get a glimpse of what it means to let go and how one actually does, goes about letting go. It's quite simple. As you start to see impermanence, you give up permanence or you give up those things that you were clinging to because you thought they were stable. As you start to see suffering, you give up those things that you thought were bringing you happiness that weren't actually bringing you happiness. As you start to see non-self, you give up those things that you thought were you and yours and belong to you. Once that clinging ceases, then suffering ceases. The suffering and the stress which comes from the ignorance and the delusion. So the middle way is very much just a simplification. It's about giving up those things that one might call extreme and often call extreme because they end, end up being opposites. This is no good, so let's do this. This is no good, let's do this. And There's this argument over the two and the Buddha just says, you know, neither is really good. In terms of our meditation, it does feel very much like uh, uh, being in the middle because you give up your desires and you give up your aversions. 
because you're you're patient with pleasant things. You're patient with unpleasant things, obviously, but you're also patient with pleasant things. When something pleasant comes, you have to be just as patient, in the sense of not jumping for it. You think of something you want, chocolate, to, to find the patience, the, the ability to be with the experience, wanting, wanting, for example, or li uh, liking, liking, or feeling, feeling. As much as you are for pain, so when you feel unpleasant sensations, you say pain, pain, or disliking, disliking, and you just be with them. That's really the path. And when you experience disliking, you're not trying to, to shut it off or stop it, but you're also not going with it. When you're angry, when you're bored, when you're frustrated. And when you want something, you're not trying to shut it off, saying, no, bad, that's a problem. But you're also not going with it. You're objective. You say liking, liking, or wanting, wanting. And let it go. Let it come, let it go. So, there you go. There's a sort of abbreviated, well, moderate. There's a moderate talk, moderate length talk on, on the, the middle way. So thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all the best.